have a minute. Good evening. Welcome to a regularly scheduled meeting of the Waterloo City Council. Um, before we get started, I will have Councillor Stubbert lead us in the I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. If anybody would like an agenda, they are uh, in the plastic logo on the wall in the back. First off, I just want to say congratulations to everybody that was involved in the recent campaigns, the elections last night, and I have to say I'm very proud to live in a community where so many people are willing to step up and run for office. It's not easy to put yourself out there and go through that. It's not easy to um, come up here with all these people do is give a lot of their time uh, that they don't really get paid for to volunteer for the community. So congratulations to everyone. Uh, next up, I have a proclamation for uh, declaring a small business Saturday. Whereas Waterville, Maine celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and community, and whereas small businesses employ 55% of the working population of the United States, and whereas 89% of consumers in the United States agree that small businesses contribute positively to the local community by supplying jobs and generating tax revenue, and whereas 87% of consumers in the United States agree that small businesses are critical to the overall economic health of the United States. And whereas 93% of consumers in the United States agree it is important for people to support small businesses that they value in their community. And whereas Waterville supports our local businesses that create jobs, boost our local economy, and preserve our neighborhood. And whereas advocacy groups as well as public and private organizations across the country have endorsed the Saturday after Thanksgiving as Small Business Saturday. Now, therefore, I, Nicholas Cisco, Mayor of Waterville, on behalf of the City Council and residents of Waterville, do hereby proclaim November 28, 2015, as Small Business Saturday and urge residents of our community and communities across the country to support small businesses and merchants on Small Business Saturday as well as throughout the year. And I will note, it is small businesses that in your communities that typically pay higher than minimum wage and they generate local dollars that actually stay within the community, they're not getting shipped off to a corporate office somewhere else. So, uh, important things to consider. Does that include Holy Canola? I believe it does. Next up is community notes. Community notes is a time where if you have anything you'd like to say or talk about or speak about that is not currently on the agenda, now is the time to do so. I would just ask that you come on up to the podium and let us know who you are, we have to say. I am going to give preferential treatment to Jennifer Olson from Ottawa Main Street because I believe she's going to piggyback on the Small Business Proclamation. I sure am. Thank you very much uh, for letting me jump in on this. Um, as you know, uh, I'm Jennifer Olson. I'm the Executive Director of Waterville Main Street, and so we are the community champion for Small Business Saturday, so thank you very much for adopting this proclamation. Um, we are working in a consortium uh, that's called Small Business Waterville, and I wanted the community to, to know about this. Um, Waterville Main Street, KB Cog, the mid Main Chamber of Commerce, and the Library Business Career and Creativity Center, and the Central Main Growth Council are all working together um, to have a concerted economic development impact for Waterville. And so I also really want to take this time to invite all of you and everyone who is in the listening range uh, to a couple of ribbon cuttings that we have going on in our downtown so we, we can celebrate our champions with, with, our, with our feet and our smiles to welcome them to downtown. And they are, there's a, there are two ribbon cuttings and they are November 10th at 4 p.m. one after the other. And it's uh, the two new businesses that we'd like to welcome are Rustic Charm and You Broke It Computer Repair. So that's such a question mark in there, too. So. Um, and the other thing that I really want to highlight is Maine Biz just announced the best places to work in Maine. And we have two downtowners who made the list this year, GHN Insurance and uh, Quebec Federal Savings. So it's a great day to be from Waterville, right? So um, and, and lastly, um, we have, uh, we have scheduled, as you know, our Cranville Bill celebration begins the day before. 
and we go throughout the holiday season with our downtown business with Santa, but we also have a holiday open house that's scheduled for December 12th. So mark your calendar, so it'll be more fun to be had downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Next up for community notes. Oh, yes. It's okay. I'm just going to piggyback on the fact that we just spent the last hour and a half in the adjoining room uh, with about, let's say, 25 other people having fantastic conversation uh, looking at what should, what could, what needs to be done with downtown and walking, biking, um, how do you want your storefronts, this, that, and so forth. So, and um, it is fascinating for me to sit in a group like that because I probably was the champion as far as age goes. And um, really nice seeing people, young people who were there between the ages of about 18 and 35. That is the core we need to be bringing to Waterville and to the downtown and Waterville. So, Good work, as always, Jen, Thank with you. what's going on here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Heather Merrill, and I live at 9 on Earth Street, and I've been under the weather for a couple of weeks, but I drove by Green Street Park, and I just wanted to say thank you to the city, to everyone involved. The park looks amazing. It went from a cluster mess to now you can actually count the trees there. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hi, John Coates, Quarry Road Recreation Area. And I also want to say thank you. I believe that we're two thirds of the way toward finalizing the contribution. City Waterville to Quarry Road. It looks like we're approaching our match. Uh, that will be worth an additional $122,000 that will allow us to finish our basic infrastructure. And I'd like to thank Fred, who might not be here much longer. Fred and Rosemary, who I know personally, Nick and John, who I've worked with over a number of years, for all your efforts and patience and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, this is a wonderful thing, again, for the city and the whole area, and I think it's, it's going to grow from here, and that's, this is a huge boost. Another thing I'd like to say is that we're approaching a point at Corey Road, and I'm just going to toss this out, uh, not asking for anything, but just get it in the mindset that the Carabasset right Valley uh, is predominantly a recreation area and the, the city or the town is, is involved with it uh, very largely and they coordinate with another group, uh, the main Hudson Trails, for skiing and biking and so on. And we could actually plug into that whole network. We have the ability here to kind of grow and if we could get the Alphonse Center going and green to the south end plugged in, you could grow and, and you know, move in that direction. And so I just want to toss that out in the mindset, be thinking a little bit about those long-term lifetime uh, activities that we can foster here. And, and also, uh, again, uh, not immediate, but think about adding, it would be great if we had a half-time position out of Quarry Road, a presence of an individual. Because at this point, as we finish our infrastructure, we want to make it as attractive and, and uh, user-friendly as we can. So I'll toss that out to you, and thanks very much. Mike Roy, 
Um, Hi, uh, Jabbar Carter, the board six, and I'm uh, here representing in Cold Waterville uh, today. I'm stepping in for Dan Chasse, who's usually here reporting. Uh, but I just want to make everyone aware that we have a website in fullwaterville.org or youtube.com slash in fullwaterville. And you can check out all these council meetings um, that have been recorded. We post all of them. I uh, also have them live as well, so if you can't make it, you can see it live. Um, we're going to be doing the Kringle Bill Parade as well. That goes on every year, and we have a few other parades that we've recorded. So if you get a chance to check us out, um, like our page on Facebook, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. That's pretty much every, I think, every public event. I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. we're trying to get out there as much as we can. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Anybody else for community? I just want to make some comments about um, back on October 26, we had a public meeting about the Head of Falls and what to do with the area <coughs> and some of the common sides are historic Head of Falls waterfront property is a city masterpiece that the canvas <coughs> matters that is yet to paint and it truly become. Everyone that is a Wattle resident, business executive and our own city officials have aspirations to what we would be the most enticing draw to people that wish to spend real quality time in it. The public forum we had on October 26th in Council Chambers was, in my mind, an epic discussion of well thought out ideas and suggestions by members of our community that are seriously interested in finally seeing development manifest itself there within their lifetimes. Um, in conversations with my own constituents, they overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly are for a future development of the Head of Falls, but attention is now focused on Main Street and the new purchasing and future developments of historic buildings long vacant with no blight seemingly polluted by a lack of habitation and neglect. We must acknowledge that our arts and cultural landscape is the melting pot foundation for greater things to happen. Our partnerships with Colby College and empowered private investment is just what the medical business experts have written for a prescription for our beloved community in water. So I urge the city policy to ensue with Head of Falls, but I implore that we first strengthen the developing relationships we have now in transforming the downtown to becoming the most recognized economic boom in Central Maine. Thank you. Anybody else? Council Boucher. I just want to uh, introduce my daughters who are here tonight for the first time at a city council meeting, <laughs> India and Riviera. And um, they're already asking if they could sit in the mayor's seat. So, <laughs> <laughs> start, start them young. So, and, um, and I also just wanted to also um, congratulate everybody. Um, I know campaigning is really hard, and I think everybody involved um, stayed really positive, and, um, you know, which we haven't seen in a while. So I just want to thank everybody. It was it was nice to go to the polls and see everybody, and everybody was just positive and happy, and um, and just, just say thank you to Karen and Fred, and um, I just look forward to more positive campaigns in the future. Anybody else, community notes? One once, twice, no. All right, next up will be the approval of the consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Yes. On to unfinished business, order 1372015. An order providing for amendment to order 156-2012. Be it hereby ordered by the City Council of the City of Waterville, acting as municipal officers as follows. Whereas order number 156-2012 was approved in September 2012 to provide a $100,000 loan to the Friends of Poor Road to construct a maintenance building. And whereas the Friends of Poor Road have made good faith efforts to repay the entire amount with a recent final payment of $25,000. And whereas the Friends of Poor Road have raised almost $2 million for equipment, buildings, and other improvements at the Corey Road Recreation Area over the past five to seven years, <coughs> and whereas the Friends of Corey Road have committed to spending the re recent $25,000 payment on continued improvements at the site, now therefore be hereby ordered by the City Council, acting as municipal officers, to return the $25,000 check to Friends of Corey Road and to accept $75,000 as the full payment for the City's financial commitment. Move to adopt. Second. And can I get a roll call? Councilor Stewart? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Winslow? Yes. Councilor Mayhew? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Boucher? Yes. The vote is six in favor and zero opposed. 
Next would be order 138015. Move to read by title only. Second. All those in favor? An order providing for sale of city property 13 Ann Street. Move to adopt. Second. Take it a roll call. Councilor Stubber? <coughs> yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Winslow? Yes. Councilor Mayhew? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Boucher? Yes. The vote is six in favor and two roll call. Okay, next ordinance 139-2015. An ordinance providing for vacant building ordinance. We had enacted by the City Council of the City of Waterville acting as municipal <coughs> officers as follows. Let the City Council approve a vacant building ordinance as shown in the attached. The purpose of this ordinance is to require owners of vacant, abandoned, and derelict properties to register with the city so that the negative effect of such properties can be minimized for adjacent property owners. Move to adopt. Second. I assume we'll probably have some discussion on this. Uh, what you have on your calendar was the most recent form of what you received at the last meeting. There are only some proposed changes in it, though. Uh, we had some feedback from owners of property. They're wondering if there was uh, a provision to waive the fees if certain criteria are met, and well, they had been, but the city attorney left it out when he put this together, so it's now added. And the fee structure in the original was 250, and we suggested that it be raised to 500. The objective <coughs> of the ordinance is not to penalize owners of property, even though the property may be vacant, if they're with good faith trying to market the property or renovate the property. Uh, so it's a feeling that they should not be charged a fee, the fee should be waived, but that those who had abused the, the property and uh, done nothing to uh, comply with, with city codes or with uh, marketing the property, uh, that $250 wasn't sufficient, that 500 was necessary to perhaps uh, get some action. So those are the changes. And as we mentioned last time, this is based on Bangor's ordinance, and now Winslow has, has also <coughs> It's very similar to this. And as you know, our city attorney also is the Winslow attorney, so he, he based this on what he had done in Winslow. Mark, Mike, do you know if, if any city that has this kind of ordinance has had much luck actually uh, recouping fees and assessing penalties where fees aren't paid, you know? I, I think it's much too early to tell. Augusta just recently adopted one, right. and that was in the summer, so I don't know if there's been enough experience out there. We could check with Bangor. They've probably been a little longer, but it's, it's a very new thing. Any idea how much additional manpower is going to be required to enforce this kind of a... Has uh, Augusta been able to take care of it with their existing code enforcement people? As far as I know, but they have a lot more than the one person we have. So there's no question in my mind. Um, and of course Garth is here and he can speak to it too. There's no question in his mind or my mind that we can't do it with one person. We can't take upon... Our, the office can't take it upon itself to enforce this with just what we have today. I, I told Mike uh, in a meeting we had earlier that uh, I felt we definitely need a second code officer too. And if I got reelected, I would support it. And if I didn't, he was on his own. So. But I feel we need two code officers. Uh, so if, if they're actively marketing the vacant building with a for sale sign on it, they don't have to pay the $500 fee. That's correct. Okay, now that building could sit on the market for years and years and years to come, and who knows if they're gonna maintain that. The definition of the word active. Uh, just putting a sign on it's not active with my okay. And it's the same with construction. They may say they're gonna renovate, but they may not be renovated, and they have to actively be renovated. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm just concerned that it may be abused, they'll put a sign on it and say, oh yeah, we're actively marketing. It, 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 it could be, you're right. But 
but two of the people the, that, there's a whole list of maintenance standards mm -hmm. listed yeah. here for the building so mm -hmm. i think fred is right it has it it has to be in good standing yeah you know yeah, it's just the manpower to one, one of the first that. people to comment on this was paul bogosian and of course paul was sitting there on two large empty buildings one of them not in very good shape uh, so he was wondering if, if he had to pay fees and I said, in my opinion, uh, as long as he's actively marketing it, and he certainly is, then, then he's okay. But he's not marketing for sale. He's, he's marketing for sale. He's looking for tenants. This says for sale. Mm -hmm. Council Mayhew. Yeah, there's a I think everybody knows my, my, my input on this. I have uh, corresponded with everybody on this council about how I feel about this. I really, looking at this ordinance and reading it line by line, understanding it, um, I think it's fair. What do you mean? I think it's consistent. I think it's continual. <coughs> I think it has teeth to it. Uh, other municipalities yeah. around the state are passing ordinances like this. I am in agreement with all of the council here that they, we do need the manpower. Uh, that is that is a precedent that we Obviously, if we're going to pass this ordinance, we have to make a motion to think of trying to fit this in the budget someplace to have a second code enforcement officer. I think everybody's under the realization that is, a, that is definitely a need. And the biggest word is accountability. Um, for me, I've been out on the streets in my ward just recently. And I've seen houses, and I've seen buildings, and I have, been, I have heard concerns from neighbors that are just just irate and, and bothered by these blights that are sitting right in their neighborhoods. And we have to take our neighborhoods back from a public safety standpoint, from a criminal activity standpoint, to an evaluation of your property abutting this property standpoint. I mean, it's just real <coughs> common sense for us to have something of a legal document and an enforceable act that we can do with the right manpower and a revenue source, this could potentially be a revenue source that could pay in long term looking ahead for a code enforcement officer. This is something that you know I think is overdue and I think it's needed and I certainly have the majority consensus of at least my constituents that are all for this. Garth, would you like to come up to the podium and talk to you for a little bit? <coughs> What, what's the consensus here? For what, what are your thoughts about this and what the impact of this is on your office as is? Um, please feel free to speak to you. First and foremost, you're going to need uh, another code enforcement officer and a secretary. The paperwork is involved with filling out the permits and all that stuff, and the legal stuff is going to come down, it's going to be astronomical, and you have no idea, because I don't know if any of you have talked to the Apartment Owners Association, the Real Estate Owners Association, but they're dead against this. They've got a lot of lawyers. They're going to fight this tooth and nail. All right, just like the other communities. Nobody else is doing this. They've got the same thing you can come right there. you got an ordinance, but it hasn't been enforced anyway yet, just because they don't know how to get deal with it legally. It's going to be an issue, but for us to go out and do this every day, you're going to you're going to put two more people on the staff, or it ain't going to happen. So, and you guys make the rules, and we just follow them. So, so Gareth, you say other um, cities like Augusta just haven't enforced this, mm -hmm. as far as you're concerned. They haven't hired anybody new. They just, they just don't enforce it. Is that right? That's right. How about Bangor? Do you have any, any idea what Bangor does? They does the same thing. They're still trying to figure out how to enforce it, how to get the fees, how to do this and how to do that. Winslow's doing the same thing. You know, we can write ordinances all day long. We've got plenty of ordinances out there. But it's a matter of how much money do you want to spend in court? Because that's what it's going to boil down to. And is there any way, I guess the question is, is there any way the fees that you recoup, if any, are going to offset the uh, additional expense? Of no, that's not going to be. You're not going to get enough money to be able to support that. I mean, we, we, have, we base this job on permits based on the economy. Some years we get two, three hundred thousand, some years we get thirty thousand. 
this coming year looks like it's going to be a banning year for us next year, not right now, because of all the investment on Main Street and so forth, other folks coming in. That's great. That's going to help fund the, fund the program. But, I, I, you know, we're working with the banks right now and different people right now because the state came out with this legislation. And so far, it's been working really good. We're getting banks that are calling us. They're jumping on their properties. But, you know, you have to use a common sense factor. If you look at the ordinance, the way it's written, we're supposed to go to somebody who's foreclosed on a property that's in bad shape. And we expect them to put a new roof and new windows and new doors in this place. That's not going to happen. In reality, that's not going to happen. We can get them to mow the lawns and secure the building. I mean, you have to look at it. If it was in your situation, if you were to make a house over here, would you want somebody saying, you need to put $300,000 in this place, so we're going to find you and take you to court and all this? No. We try to work with everybody the best we can. Use common sense approach, and... And you've seen a reaction from the state law office. Yeah. Uh, what would Council White do? I mean, it, it, it is a great idea, safety-wise, because, you know, after the building is registered, they have to put a placard on the front door, provided by you, mm -hmm. that you're going to have to make, which, I mean, there you go for a secretary or another person um, that has all their contact information. Now, for the fire department, that is a great thing, because when they go to a vacant building, they try to get the comm center to get a responding person, and not all that information is correct. And so they can't get in, or they have to break in, or... Um, which, it, I mean, it's a great idea, um, but that alone, you know, making flat cars for all these buildings, you know, and updating them, I could see. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a real plus for all of us. Please fire our office, the neighbors. Yeah. It's really great. Yeah. And so far, it's, it's starting to turn for us. Mm -hmm. And I think the ordinance is great because it follows along with every other community that's trying to do the same thing. You know, the housing boom that went down and crashed there in 2008, created a lot of problems throughout this entire country. And we're all trying to figure out how to fix it. And it's a, it's a long process because you're dealing with a lot of people, a lot of different banks, a lot of different organizations that are out there that it just, uh, it's, it's difficult. You know, having the ordinance gives us some teeth to work with, but we have to use a lot of common sense with this thing. Yeah. Really with the, with this ordinance, thing. yep. Yeah. And really, uh, it's, it's 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 really too early to tell. Councilor Boucher. Um, Garth, I I really respect you being here and, and giving your opinion, and I respect you as the city manager because I know you guys have been you know working on this, um, and you've been coming to us at least since I've been a counselor, asking for help and, you know, kind of begging for it during budget season and then each time we cut it but at the end based on something. So, um, but I am hearing from, you know, constituents that, so what do we do with these vacant properties that are obviously not being cared for and are ending up becoming a danger or just a nuisance in the neighborhood? Could something like this give you a little bit more power, though, to go to those, at least the worst buildings in our city and have something to, you know, to petition to find them for? I mean, would it give you a little bit more power than just going there and knocking and issuing something? I mean, would it help at all? The only thing it's really going to help us with is, is the foreclosure process, <laughs> the banks. Because that's a, a most neglected. I've got three houses in Waterville, personally owned, and the people live out of state. And they don't give us any mailing information. We've sent letters. We get nothing back. That's only three. Most of them are foreclosures. And right now, most of them are being knocked out and taken care of. The lawns are being mowed and they're being taken care of. Most of them. And you're going to have a few in every neighborhood. And I don't care where you live, you're going to run into this problem. You know, it's nice to think we're going to have a perfect world here, but it isn't. We have to deal with it one on one, but it is it is helpful. It gives us something to work with. So, because I, I, you know, I've I've had these concerns that you've had, um, but I, I think if you know, um, Councillor Severin, you know, say getting something on the books, just getting something to start mm -hmm. in the city is a start, 
And I think, you know, we do have some buildings, you know, in, in different parts that maybe it would be a start for the city to actually take this seriously, that we are taking this seriously and we're not going to allow landlords to leave their properties um, to become nuisance. So I, I think that's kind of where I'm at is that I, I agree with you. I think the manpower and the, the amount of work and, and not knowing what next budget season will have for us, but getting something on the books might give our city a little power. I don't know if you agree with that mind as well. But. You're saying rather than having to overuse it, you at least use it as something now just as a tool in this pocket. Is that? Yeah. Well, just in a, in, in a nutshell, what I was, in, you know, your opinion matters to me. So in your preferred uh, professional, personal opinion, is this a good start to where we want to be? It's a good start where we want to go. We're just need mm -hmm. discussion with it. We can't get well, we need to so be realistic about what we can do. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's, That's the combination between yes. the two of you that works. But I think when the legislature passed that law that banks have to report to us, that's a huge, huge milestone for us. And then taking what we have here and Mango and Born and everybody else trying to do the same thing just modifies it, makes it a little bit more easier to work with. But again, I, I, I caution extreme common sense with all of this stuff because not every situation, you know, warrants us to go out and beat people down to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars on something that they, they ain't get money to do. So but I will need help. It is impossible for me to take care of I can barely take care of what I got going on now. So if we can't fund it, there's no sense out of it. Okay. Is there any other questions regarding yeah. yeah Garth, I same thing, I respect your opinion on this whole women's thing, and I understand exactly where you're coming from and what the, uh, the pressure and, and the anxiety sort of is to some of this, and the common sense approach is the right way to go, and I think you have to use your discretion in a lot of different areas. I don't, I, I believe in the same thing, you can't pound, you know, against people that are impenetrable or are unwilling to move, but you have, I still feel like, like Council, Council Boucher said, is that this is still a good stepping stone uh, a good tool that's left in your arsenal, and I am very much supportive and pursuant of looking to get you some assistance as well. If we're going to make any headway at all in, in true code cool enforcement and true, you know, cooperation, collaboration together, um, but I really believe that this this still has enough merit to it uh, to seriously consider it and seriously get it as far as on the books and then supplement it as we move forward into budget season uh, to try to give it some more bite to it. Right, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just, you know, I want this council to remember this conversation because for two years we've asked for a new code of force officer, we've asked for a south end officer to start fixing these problems. And every single time, it was like me and Karen against a wall and counselors say, no, nope, we don't want to raise taxes, or no, nope, you know, we don't have money to do that. So I really hope that we're not just talking the talk, and that we actually give guards in our city the help that it needs in order to make the change. Because if we want our city to be cleaned up, we need people out there doing the work. I have a question. Heather Merrill, Nine Auto Street. Not familiar with the ordinance, but I have a question. So, I pay $500 because I have a vacant building and it has a placard on it. What's that do? Now I just have an official vacant building because nothing is still going to be done. It's still going to be a vacant building. It's still going to have a long lawn. It's still going to have no windows. It's still going to have no doors. Now all that means is that I'm living in Massachusetts or Florida lying on the beach and my property is legal because I paid $500 for my placard that says where I am. No, 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 no. I didn't I didn't read the ordinance, so I'm just wondering. All kinds of requirements. But if you don't comply with those requirements, you could be fined civilly by the by the city and they could put a lien against your building for all kinds of assessments against your building. And there are all kinds of you can do read the there are all kinds of little uh, details regarding uh, structural members, walls, exterior walls. Overhanging extension. There's all kinds of. Okay, so I'm just wondering here. Because sitting in the audience, I mean, I don't know how many people spread it. Yeah, and I'm so just thinking now all I have is just a legal building, yeah, but so that's the only moment. Once you get the permit, you can 
permit, um, the owner must arrange for an inspection of the building, mm -hmm. and then that inspection has to go through, and there's a list of items oh. that it has to. Thank you. Yeah. I think this is a good start. So yeah. motion, no doubt. Second. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need two votes on this, right? Yes. Yeah, right. yeah, right. All those in favor? One. I thought one talking about. Oh, there's more discussion. Yeah. Right. Mr. Mack, you are excited. I just want to actually talk to you and tell you that we need to do something. Because there's a construction crew today that's been doing work by my house, and they commented on the two buildings that are on the street that they are working on. If there's two vacant buildings, and also some of these commercial buildings have to be taken care of. I know the fire chief can help me out with this, but if you actually go and look up firefighter deaths and the amount of firefighters that have been killed in vacant buildings, because when they get there, they're told, oh, there's squatters in the building. I don't know if you guys remember Western Massachusetts. They pulled up in this big vacant warehouse, they were told there's people in there, they had gotten out. Six firefighters. And not make it out of that building alive. Do we? Uh, so far, nothing like that's happened here. Would it ever happen? Who knows? Let's stop it before it does happen, and let's stop it before even civilians could get hurt. Now there could be a building that could be looks okay on the outside. They step in, the floor is rotted. They go through the basement. It gets hurt. Now who's responsible? Is the city, the owner? It just basically opens up for a lawsuit. So. I mean, something needs to really be done about these vacant buildings, and look at it does in the city. It makes our city look, you know, basically doesn't make it look attractive. Thank you, Mr. McAdoo. And I will say the debate is officially closed. There's a motion on the floor. All those in favor? All in favor? Resolution 1412015. A resolution provides for acceptance of a proposal for a new rescue vehicle. Be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Waterville acting as fiscal officer as follows. That the City Council accepts the low bid proposal from Customs Park and Body Works Incorporated of Woodbury, Georgia for $146,680 and approves up to $150,000 for the construction of a new rescue vehicle for the fire department. The money for this project will come from the 2013 bond issue. Move to adopt. Second. Do we need some discussion on this? Well, just make it clear. The 146680 <laughs> is just a part of the 150, right? It's not 146 plus 150. Right? Like Correct. It. Now, is this, this is what we spoke about at length. Yeah. Does that look like the Winslow truck? Is that correct? Uh, more like the Belgian truck. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So, the 150 should take care of any contingencies that might be involved. Basically, what it is, we start the truck renewal and come in for under 150. <coughs> so, they came in under 46. Uh, we, you know, we sent out bids for 10 companies, we got two back. The one we actually worked very closely with came in at 176, uh, which was a surprise. But um, we're willing, I've talked a lot to the people that are in Woodbury, Georgia. Uh, they want to make us happy. Um, we've had some concerns. We spent a lot of time working over the Woodbury truck that was built. We told them there were things we didn't like, how they did this, and they said we don't do that anymore. They want to build us a truck we'll be happy with that uh, nobody else can build better. So I'm comfortable now that. You know, I'd, I'd like to go to the 150 because we cut a lot of stuff uh, to get in at that price. Some stuff I'd like to put back. Great. Uh, David, I know I asked you this before, but what are you going to do with the old truck? We had vendors. We, we tried to put it out there uh, for the companies that sell, and nobody was interested. So I do not know uh, what the best toy is going to be. It might just have to go for scrap. I have no intention on holding on to it. Is, is it rusted out or is it? Yeah, that, that's why nobody it is really rusted out. interested. Yeah. Right. Engine's probably okay though, isn't it? Not really. Um, the engine, that, that truck was designed with like a commuter freight liner truck that is a delivery truck uh, engine. Uh, thin wall, I believe. I know I want at least a second engine in there, maybe the third. Oh, really? Yeah, this doesn't hold up. Okay. 
for bigger rest of calls anyway, you take one of the engines with you. We, so you we spec up the last couple of engines to share the weight and make this a more efficient uh, vehicle for going to house call, which is <coughs> a large percentage of our business. <coughs> Thank you, Chief. Thank you. All those in favor? I would like to yield my time under the manager's report to Chuck Hawkins. It's important for you every so often to get a finance report. The first quarter of our year is ended, July, August, September. So Chuck is going to pass out a quick summary of where we stand in the first three months. Revenues and expenditures. Overall, I think we're in good shape on target, but I'm going to let Chuck provide you with a few more specifics. So the, the first page on that list is the list of all the donations and grants that we've accepted under 5,000 because we policy states that we can do that without your approval, but that I need to show it to you quarterly. So if you got any questions on any of those, um, I don't think there was anything that stood out to me. You can see that for the radar sign downtown, we had um, Walmart and Waterloo Main Street pitched in on that one. And quite a bit of money came in for the skate park. So good to see there. Any questions on that? Okay. The next two sheets is just a summary of the revenues and then the expenses. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is it's only three months into the year. A lot of the budget items are spread evenly over 12 months. So there's variances on a lot of it and almost everything is timing. So I'm gonna point out a couple things that are known differences that will probably be different for the whole year. But for the most part, I'm gonna tell you everything's pretty much timing. And then if you guys have questions, we can go over But just keep in mind, most of the variances are just timing related. Um, the, the first line item on revenue, you'll see taxes. Um, we got a positive variance of $74,000, and basically that's going to be the overlay. Our overlay was about $175,000 this year. So we do all we do in the budget and then wait for Paul to finish his evaluation stuff and plug in the mill rate, and lo and behold, our revenue is always going to be a little bit different than what we budgeted. So our revenue that we assessed everybody is a little bit higher for the year. Now, by the end of the year, we only get account revenue that we collect. So that's the one thing that I, I can never tell you exactly what our final revenue budget is going to be because if people don't pay their taxes, I don't get to count it. Um, the next item down of any size would be the excise taxes. Um, 71000 72000 better than planned. Most of that is timing, but I will tell you we are running ten or $15,000 ahead of last year, which is nice. I mean, I think... We've seen the excise taxes go up over the last few years. I think people are finally buying new cars. New cars cost more money. So our excise taxes are, are going up a little bit. We've budgeted, I think, 50000 higher for the last couple of years. Um, Intergovernmental revenue, that's 172, 171, 716. That one is a timing issue. The, the biggest piece is there is you have the Betty and you have the Homestead. And the way we account for that, we get all the homestead stuff up front and we get the Betty stuff later in the year. So it's just a timing thing. We're not really going to be that much better than planned. Um, but right now it looks like you know, we're well ahead of time and we really should be pretty close. Um, next one down that I point out was like Parks and Recreation is a perfect example of a timing thing. They're looking great compared to budget, but that's because a lot of their revenue comes in during the same time. <coughs> then you don't have a whole lot for a while, and then you'll have a bunch at the, at the year end. So once again, it, it looks positive, but it's, you know, there's no reason to think we're going to be anything better than plan on that one. Um, planning and code enforcement were below budget by $31,000. As Garth had said, you know, it's kind of a hit or miss. You never know from year to year. That's one, unless we get some big things coming in this year, we probably you know, struggle to meet our budget. But who knows what's going to happen between now and and June as far as any of these things that people are talking about doing. 
Um, and the last one is the 47,000 444 under other revenue. That's primarily, that's a timing thing as well. That's the franchise fee is the biggest piece of the other revenue and that's time order. We get a piece of money from them. We usually get the biggest chunk of that about December or January. So basically we haven't gotten any of it yet. Um, and the budget would be spread evenly over the 12 months. So are there any questions on any of the revenue? Okay, now if you go to the expense. And once again, I'm going to just tell you, pretty much across the board, everything is timing on this one with the exception of a couple items um, that I'm aware of as of now. Like human resources is a big number, but that's, that's a totally timing thing because the biggest piece in that budget is going to be workers comp and, and that is not spread evenly across the time. Um, and there's also health reimbursement stuff, health related stuff that, that also is cyclical. So that's why that one is off. Um, economic development, we look, we're, we're over budget $24,000 so far, but that's one where we pay like KV Cog or we pay um, First Park. Growth, First Park, Growth Council. A lot of that stuff we pay one time payment. So we pay it in, I pay it in June, I mean, sorry, July or August but the budget is spread evenly. So that's one, there's no reason to think we're gonna be over budget on economic development. Um, public works always looks great this time of year. We're $200,000 under budget. Wouldn't that be great? Well, we haven't plowed a single snowstorm yet, so. No snow to plow in the summer? What's that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that one always looks great early on, but uh, don't get too excited. Parks and Rec, just the opposite of that. Just like I said, the revenue looks good while their expenses don't look so good because they had a lot of work to do during the summertime. That will all even itself out over the course of the year. Um, police is a little bit over budget. It's primarily um, wages related and a lot of that stuff is, I just think it's, it's during the summertime and they're ramping up some certain things and all that, but there was nothing that was alarming there. Um, let's see here. Debt service, $112,000 over budget. That's definitely a timing thing. We, have, we make payments two or three times a year on our bonds, and that's it. And once again, the budget's pretty evenly so large. I mean, that's, that's about the easiest budget line I have to budget, because for the most part, I know exactly what my debt payments are gonna be for the next year. So that one won't be right on. Um, transfer to TIF funds. That's one, it's $74,000 over budget, and that's one that I just take the full year budget. I know what the full amount's gonna be, because once we do the assessment, and we will be over budget by $74,000 on our transfer. That's the TIF revenue that came in that we have to transfer out to the TIF fund. So we will be over budgets by $74,000 this year. The good news associated with that means that our values were higher, so we brought in more revenue. So some of that money will go out in CEA payments. Some of it means we have extra money in our TIFs that we get to keep money in the downtown TIF maybe the airport TIF, then pipeline TIF. So some of that money actually is money for us to spend in future years. Um, so don't, don't be too alarmed that we're gonna be over budget because remember revenue is over budget as well, so. And the last one I'm gonna point out is the county tax. It, it's $11,000 under budget, but that's one that, that's what the number's gonna be. We're gonna be $11,000 better than budget for the year because we know what the tax was. We budget a little bit higher because at the time we're doing the budget, we don't know exactly what it's going to be. So there's savings there for us. And that is what I've got. Any questions? The audit is hopefully going to be complete and presented to you guys December 1st, I think is the first Tuesday meeting. That's the plan. The auditors aren't done with the meeting yet. So hopefully that will be done and then you guys will get that number. We are going to be better than what I projected as far as our use of fund balance. So um, that's the only that's the big thing you guys are always pushing for. So we should be okay on that one. So that's all I've got. Thanks, Thank you. Hey, Chuck. We have a couple guests, I think we're going to adjourn this meeting. One of you gets the seat, one of you gets the hammer. <laughs> <laughs>
I'll give you a motion to adjourn. <laughs>